Well, good morning, you hearty souls. Thank you for joining us on a snowy day, although I must admit it's the perfect setting for a conversation about the Arctic. Good morning, my name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I have the great privilege of looking after Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. Um, this, in some ways, has been a bit of an Arctic week for us here at CSIS. Yesterday, we had the privilege of hosting the Norwegian foreign minister in a conversation about finding that Arctic balance between economic opportunities and, and environmental protection. And of course, we talked about a range of geopolitical issues that are impacting the Arctic. But today is a conversation that we're going to focus in on the United States and the development of our policy as we look forward in two very short months uh, to assuming the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. I can't imagine Imagine that we have uh, any three officials that can help us understand uh, some very new developments in U.S. Arctic policy formation and coordination. At the end of January, the White House released an executive order that uh, pro provided a new uh, framework, a, a new uh, structure, a, an Arctic Executive Steering Committee. And uh, we're here to learn more about that very, not even barely a month old executive order, what it will mean, uh, the impact it will have on uh, U.S. Arctic policy. With us this morning, we have and are delighted to welcome Dr. John Holdren, Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. He's served as the Assistant to the President for Science and Technology since 2009 and co-chairs the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And as of end of January, he has a very new title, Chair Arctic Executive Steering Committee. So he is the leader of this new entity. And uh, Dr. Holdren, we're, we're grateful that you're here and we look forward to your uh, presentation to help help give us a little bit more uh, understanding of this new uh, new steering committee. And then with us, uh, Tommy Boudreau to my left, Chief of Staff to Secretary Sally Jewell at the Department of Interior prior to becoming uh, Chief of Staff in March of last year. Mr. Boudreau was the Director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management from 2010 to 2014. Uh, he has done a, a lot of work uh, looking at the Department of Interior's engagement uh, with the uh, uh, drilling activities in the Chutki and the Beaufort, and we're delighted. Uh, Secretary Jewell was just in Alaska, just had a very tough hearing uh, on Tuesday with uh, Senator Murkowski, so we're looking forward to hearing. We'll do it again next week. And we'll do it again next week, because <laughs> it was so much fun again, and uh, we look forward to thank you so much. We really look forward to your insights. And then last but not least, we have Carrie, uh, Gary Rassicott, Director of Marine Transportation Systems at the Coast Guard. Admiral Pete Neffinger was to be with us, the Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard, but uh, had to be pulled away uh, for another uh, assignment. So we are delighted that Mr. Rassicott could be with us. Um, uh, Gary has uh, responsibilities for waterways management, coastal and marine spatial planning, and polar ice operations. Yes, I fear you're going to get a question about an icebreaker. Um, uh, and prior to this, uh, his work as uh, director, he served as the director of Global Maritime Operational Threat Response Coordination Center from 2010 to 2013. So I wasn't kidding. We have uh, great minds here to help us uh, tease out a little bit more on uh, U.S. domestic policy as it evolves towards the Arctic. And with that, we welcome you all, and we turn it over to Dr. Holdren for his presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Heather, uh, and thanks to uh, all of you for showing up uh, on a snowy morning, uh, and thanks to those who are watching uh, the webcast. Uh, I want to start by mentioning that I'm accompanied by Dr. Simon Stevenson, who is OSTP's Assistant Director for Polar Science. He's right down here, and if I get any really hard questions, of course, I'll just refer them to him. That's a good point. Uh, so let me uh, start uh, this tour of the terrain, as it were, with a look at the geographic terrain, uh, what we consider officially to be the Arctic uh, within the framework uh, of the Arctic Council and our other Arctic activities, uh, all United States and foreign territory north of the Arctic Circle, and all U.S. territory north and west uh, of the boundary that is shown there extending below uh, the Arctic Circle. Now, maybe this page down works better. Okay. Good. I just have to get the right page down key. So we have, uh, as I think everybody in this room probably already knows, a large variety of national interests in the Arctic. Uh, defense, uh, sovereign rights and responsibilities, maritime safety, 
uh, the economic issues, including particularly those around uh, energy development, environmental stewardship, scientific research, extremely important, uh, indigenous peoples and their rights and cultures, and of course, uh, preservation of the rights, freedoms, and uses of the sea as reflected in international law. Uh, change is happening rapidly in the Arctic and complicating uh, many of these national interests, but also opening up uh, new opportunities with respect to, to others. Uh, the temperature in the Arctic has been increasing uh, more than twice as fast as the global average uh, temperature increase. That's for well understood uh, scientific reasons. And uh, this simply illustrates uh, that the 2014 temperature anomaly compared to a 1951 to 80 average, uh, and the browner the uh, shading, the faster the uh, rate of temperature rise. As I've already noted, that rapid warming is presenting both challenges and opportunities. Uh, shrinking sea ice extent and thickness mean, of course, expanded maritime navigation possibilities. We'll doubtless hear more about that from Gary. Uh, th that expansion means, of course, economic benefits, including much shorter shipping routes uh, in many circumstances, but also some jurisdictional issues, increasing ship traffic and the need to manage that, and uh, the possibility of pollution and accidents uh, from that uh, additional shipping. Expanded access to seabed resources uh, in the Arctic. Again, economic benefits, but again, also jurisdictional issues. Uh, and uh, increasing industrial activity resulting from those opportunities. And again, uh, a set of uh, pollution and accident possibilities. Uh, those first two uh, sub-bullets imply increasing requirements for the Coast Guard, for the Navy, for other oversight management and regulatory functions in the region. Uh, another challenge is existential threats to creatures that depend on the rapidly shrinking sea ice and the indigenous communities that utilize those creatures uh, as uh, important parts of their livelihoods. Uh, increased risk to coastal communities and infrastructure from the combination of sea level rise and the loss of shoreline protection by sea ice, which when it's in place keeps big waves uh, from storms, from impacting uh, shoreline settlements uh, and infrastructure. Uh, another issue, thawing permafrost uh, threatens land transport uh, and a variety of kinds of infrastructure, including pipelines. Uh, and warming is altering plant cover, increasing vulnerability to wildfires, and affecting other aspects of ecosystem dynamics. Uh, just to give you uh, a picture of the extent of the shrinkage of the sea ice, uh, you can barely see, I, I think, the magenta line, but the magenta line is the average sea ice extent at its September minimum during the period 79 to 2000. And you look at the 2005 extent, already much smaller than that, 2007, uh, smaller still, and the record uh, low sea ice extent since satellite observations began, giving us really accurate measurements, uh, occurred in September 2012. And you see the enormous opening uh, compared to that magenta line, the enormous opening of uh, maritime possibilities and seabed access. Uh, this shows uh, both the history of Arctic sea ice extent at its September minimum and the projections under various scenarios of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and one sees that under the, the red projection, which is really continuation of business as usual, the world decides to do uh, essentially nothing uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The summer sea ice actually disappears uh, entirely uh, by the end of the century. And under the other scenarios, uh, the scenario where we take really uh, forward-leaning measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions around the world uh, gives you the, the green scenario. And even there, one ends up uh, with uh, less sea ice uh, than, uh, than we have now for at least a period, period of time. Give you a quick uh, chronology of uh, milestones in the history of Arctic policy and coordination, uh, starting with the Arctic Research and Policy Act of 1984, which was amended in 1990. It was that act that created the U.S. Arctic Research Commission 
uh, and the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Commission. The Arctic Research Commission makes recommendations. The Ar uh, Arctic Research Policy Commission uh, coordinates the responses to those recommendations across uh, federal agencies. The eight-nation Arctic Council uh, international uh, effort to uh, coordinate and cooperate was established in 1996. And we'll come back to the Arctic Council uh, at the end because the United States is assuming the chairmanship of the Arctic Council for two years starting this spring. Uh, Arctic region policy established uh, by the National Security Policy Directive 66 and Homeland Security Policy Directive 25 in January 2009. Uh, the National Ocean Council, which was established in July 2010 as part of the National Ocean Policy announced at that time by President Obama, has as one of its two major geographic focuses the Arctic. The other one is the uh, Caribbean, the Gulf. Um, Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement, that's another international agreement that was fomented under the auspices of the Arctic Council in January 2013, an agreement to collaborate on search and rescue uh, in the Arctic. Uh, the Interagency Report on Arctic Management, this was a committee chaired by then Deputy Secretary of Interior David Hayes, focused primarily uh, on the intersection of energy development and conservation, but uh, involved a strong interagency component uh, and produced uh, a wide-ranging report. The national strategy for the Arctic region was first rolled out uh, under the leadership of the National Security Council in May 2013, an implementation plan for it the following January, and a report on uh, implementation of that um, uh, strategy, national strategy for the Arctic region was just issued last month. And finally, uh, as Heather has already mentioned, uh, just last month, uh, the President issued an executive order on enhancing coordination of national efforts in the Arctic, and that included the creation of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, uh, which I now chair. The 2009 Arctic policy uh, listed uh, a number of aims, uh, and you see them here, again, underscoring uh, the diversity and complexity of our national interests in the Arctic, the national security uh, issues, the environmental and conservation issues, uh, resource management and economic development, international cooperation among the eight Arctic nations, uh, involving the Arctic's indigenous communities in decisions that affect them, and enhancing scientific monitoring and research on local, regional, and global environmental issues as they are playing out uh, in, the, in the Arctic. The 2013 strategy uh, consolidated those aims under three large headings, protect U.S. national and homeland security interests, promote responsible stewardship, and foster international cooperation. That's not a change, it's just a binning of the different uh, goals listed under the 2009 uh, strategy. Uh, reports are coming out at a great rate. Here are three of them. The National Strategy for the Arctic Region is on the right. Uh, managing for the Future in a Rapidly Changing Arctic, uh, report to the President. And uh, on the left, Arctic Research Plan 2013 to 2017. These five-year plans come out uh, at intervals uh, from uh, the National Science and Technology Council, which I also chair on behalf of the President. Um, Complicated terrain, uh, this uh, Venn diagram is uh, indicative of uh, how many different entities are involved in these uh, major bins of science and stewardship, energy development and transportation, security, uh, and international uh, relations. And of course, uh, they overlap and intersect, which is one of the reasons uh, that we need uh, a systematic uh, and comprehensive approach to coordination. Um, this amazing diagram, which if you stare at it too long may cause your heads to explode, is uh, a visualization of who's talking to whom, just in the domain of research coordination. Uh, and, um, and, and by the way, we will post this uh, PowerPoint on the OSTP website. I we'll suspect you folks well. may post it as well. And so f f any of you who want to stare at these in more detail, and at this one in particular, risk your head exploding, it will be, uh, it will be available. But again, what 
this basically illustrates is there is a tremendous amount of interaction that goes on uh, among the various departments and agencies in the federal government that have equities, responsibilities, and activities in the Arctic. Uh, the executive order came out uh, on January 21st, enhancing coordination of national efforts uh, in the Arctic and uh, again reiterates the uh, strategic, ecological, cultural, and economic issues uh, that uh, constitute our national interests in the region and, and creates this uh, uh, Arctic Executive Steering Committee. And this is what we hope to do with the Arctic Executive Steering Committee. One, help shape and reconcile priorities across all of these uh, complicated interests and intersections. Uh, promote the coordinated implementation and evaluation of all of our activities in the Arctic improve the coherence of our engagement uh, as a federal government with both the state of Alaska and the Alaska Native communities, and finally support the U.S. chairmanship uh, of the Arctic Council. So I'll close with that. The Arctic Council, again, uh, established in 1996, uh, <coughs> will be chaired by the United States in the period from uh, this spring until uh, the spring of 2017. Uh, the Arctic Council has uh, the indicated working groups, uh, which uh, correspond in substantial measure to the different categories of national interests of the United States that I've already described. Uh, U.S. departments and agencies are already actively engaged in all of these working groups and indeed in their leadership for the most part. Uh, but when we become the chair, we really have the opportunity to steer the uh, focus and the emphasis uh, in the Arctic Council uh, in the directions that we think best. The current chair is Canada, by the way. We will succeed uh, Canada in this role. And with that, uh, I will stop and uh, let my fellow panelists uh, tell us more about some of the interesting details. Thanks, Dr. Holman. That was, that was super. And yes, we will definitely make those slides available on our website as well with the video of, of the presentation. Mr. Boudreau, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Heather. Got it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Holdren and Gary. Uh, it is a pleasure to appear with you this morning. Um, a little bit about me. I'm actually an Alaskan. And uh, as everyone here is aware, the reason we're engaged in this discussion is that we're an Arctic nation because of Alaska. Uh, and so uh, this is, I'll try not to be too much of a homer uh, throughout all of these remarks, but as folks know me, I, I can't help myself. Um, as Heather described a little bit about my background, I joined the Interior Department in 2010 uh, to help the administration uh, respond to the spill in the Gulf uh, and to uh, lead sweeping reforms, uh, both with re respect to oversight of offshore oil and gas activity uh, as well as raising standards under which that activity takes place. Uh, I was told it would be a six-month assignment, and it'll be five years. Yeah, it'll be five years uh, in April. Um, part of the reason why I stayed involved, though, and this goes to my homerism, is um, the opportunities uh, that are present with respect to Alaska and the Arctic uh, and the Interior Departments. Um, uh, role in all of that. And I am excited uh, that there is an unprecedented level of coordination within the federal family uh, and with the state of Alaska as well as the people who live there. Uh, that's been the result of a um, uh, very focused effort that Dr. Holdren described uh, over several years, culminating in the recent executive order. Uh, which is really intended to bring additional levels of focus, coherence, and coordination uh, on our uh, role uh, in the international community as an Arctic nation. And so uh, it is an exciting development, and, uh, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, I also chair um, the Interagency Working Group on uh, coordination of federal uh, energy permitting. Uh, that was established, that working group was established in 2011 uh, through executive order, and it continues to this day. Um, and it is really designed to bring the federal family together uh, to coordinate 
uh, environmental reviews as well as permitting processes related to energy projects in Alaska. Uh, as an Alaskan, I can tell you, uh, in case you don't already know, uh, energy issues are the lifeblood of the state. Everyone in Alaska uh, is focused on uh, energy and resource development uh, because of the economic opportunities, but everyone in the state values uh, the environmental um, resources as well. It's part of the reason why uh, folks choose to live there. Uh, and so uh, getting that balance right has been something that uh, the administration and the Interior Department has been quite focused on, and I'll spend a little time describing some of our recent decisions. Uh, I'm sure folks have uh, or may have questions about that. It was obviously uh, a large part of the uh, subject matter of Secretary Jewell's hearing uh, earlier this week, as well as um, uh, uh, a large area of conversation when uh, we were in Kotzebue uh, last week as well. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about those uh, recent decisions, and I'm happy to answer questions about them as well. Um, the first uh, of these recent decisions was in December, uh, the president uh, withdrew from future oil and gas leasing uh, Bristol Bay, uh, or as my former agency, Boehm, would call it, the uh, North Aleutian Basin. Uh, but uh, it's really uh, that decision uh, which uh, folks had been uh, talking about for quite some time, including in particular Alaska Natives in Western Alaska and uh, fishing uh, interests in that part of the state have been advocating for for a long period of time. And so the President took action under Section 12A of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act uh, to uh, remove from consideration for future offshore oil and gas leasing that area, uh, essentially to protect uh, one of the richest fisheries in the entire world uh, and a major economic driver for the state of Alaska. Uh, that's an open-ended withdrawal. Uh, a future president could elect to reverse that. Um, obviously, we think that would be unwise. Uh, part of the reason why we left it open uh, is to give some certainty to uh, the people, Alaska Natives, who subsist from the fishing resources as well as the commercial interests there, give them some certainty about uh, the potential for offshore oil and gas leasing uh, in the fishery. Uh, under Bohm's process, uh, we go through a five-year planning process, as many of you may know. I didn't before I joined the Interior Department. I thought only Bolsheviks planned on a five-year um, yeah, cycle, but it turns <laughs> out, turns, <laughs> turns out we do it too. Um, and so we had to, um, <laughs> we had to, uh, we had the experience of having to revisit this question every five years, and it caused a lot of anxiety uh, for uh, fishermen, both Alaska Native and commercial fishermen. And so I think the president quite wisely chose, um, hey, oil and gas, uh, as we'll talk about some more, uh, is entirely appropriate in certain areas, um, but in other areas there's higher uh, or different uh, values to be protected, including in this case the fishing interests are paramount. Uh, and so uh, hopefully uh, through that action um, we relieve some of the recurring anxiety and give folks some certainty uh, about the fishery. Uh, more controversially, um, in January, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service in the Interior Department uh, published its final CCP, Comprehensive Conservation Plan, for the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, uh, which is uh, sort of the northeast corner of the state. Uh, that, I'll tell you again, as an Alaskan, this has been um, a controversial uh, and emotional issue uh, for Alaskans for more than 30 years. Uh, I remember in sixth grade debate class um, having the resolve to be uh, the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge should be open to oil and gas drilling, pro and con. And so uh, it is literally, uh, from grade schools all the way up to Washington, D.C., been a subject of debate uh, ever since ANILCA, uh, the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, uh, was passed in 1980. 
Uh, and what ANILCA says is, with respect to uh, the refuge, uh, the coastal plain, and that's really what the conversation is about, uh, is um, interest or opposition to uh, oil and gas development on the coastal plain of the refuge, uh, which uh, sometimes gets referred to as the 1002 area, again, a reference to ANILCA. Um, there is, you know, the most current, which is largely out of date actually, but the most current resource estimate uh, for the coastal plain is about 10 billion barrels of uh, potentially recoverable, technically recoverable oil. Um, as uh, Alaskans will tell you, with concern over declining production from Prudhoe Bay uh, and concern about keeping the Trans-Alaska Pipeline uh, system uh, flowing, uh, a lot of folks for a long time have looked to the coastal plain as the next potential big field. Uh, that obviously has caused a lot of controversy uh, with environmental interests and concern about the preservation of uh, what is truly uh, one of the last large intact ecosystems uh, in the world, uh, and particularly the Arctic. And so you can see sort of where the controversy lies, and it's embedded in the underlying statute of ANILCA. And so what the CCP really does is uh, it is the Fish and Wildlife Service's plan for managing the refuge. Under ANILCA, under, and there's history here, but the current posture under ANILCA is it would take an act of Congress to open uh, the coastal plain to oil and gas drilling. Uh, in 1995 or 96, a bill passed Congress um, to do that. President Clinton vetoed it uh, at that time. Uh, and since then, uh, there's been this kind of uh, equipoise. Congress would have to act uh, in order to open the coastal plain to drilling. Congress would have to act in order to establish it as wilderness and the protections that go along with that. Uh, in the absence of congressional action over the last 30 years, the Fish and Wildlife Service is responsible for continuing to manage the refuge. And so what the CCP really does, if you drain away some of the emotion and rhetoric around it, it says we're going to continue managing the refuge the way we have, uh, which under ANILCA calls for minimal management. Uh, the president, if you saw uh, the YouTube video uh, put out on this, said he would make a recommendation to Congress to establish wilderness, not a monument, uh, make a recommendation to Congress to take action in favor of wilderness. Uh, again, Congress would have to act one way or another. Um, but what that announcement did is establish the uh, administration's position with respect to the refuge. Uh, and that's obviously become um, uh, a heated issue, uh, especially with um, the delegation from my home state. Uh, near in time to that announcement, uh, my former agency, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, put out uh, its draft five-year program. Uh, we're doing that again. That cycle has started again for the 2017 to 2022 period. Uh, that program included uh, the two Arctic planning areas, the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea, uh, for potential lease sales during that period, as well as Cook Inlet, which is uh, the area um, in south central Alaska near Anchorage, um, which has some state uh, production but no federal production yet. Accompanying that, um, the publication of the draft proposed program was another decision by the President under Section 12A of OXLA to withdraw. Uh, again, open-ended withdrawal from prospective offshore oil and gas leasing, certain areas that have been long established uh, as deferred from leasing uh, in order to protect uh, subsistence activity. So this includes a 25-mile corridor uh, on the, Chukchi, the coast of the Chukchi Sea to protect uh, whaling migration where whaling activity by Alaska Natives takes place. Um, an area north of Barrow called Barrow's Canyon, again, uh, where um, Barrow whalers um, 
conduct their hunts, uh, and a small area off of Kaktovik uh, in the Beaufort Sea, again, to protect an area that the Kaktovik whalers use uh, for subsistence. Uh, these areas have been deferred from leasing. Um, another way to put it, there's been sort of agreement that they're not appropriate for leasing, spanning administrations. Uh, and, uh, and so what this decision did was, uh, again, try to relieve folks from the anxiety that goes along with having to revisit this issue every five years. Um, in my mind, sort of not especially controversial. Um, the areas of existing leases, uh, especially in the Chukchi Sea, but also uh, in the Beaufort, are largely unaffected by the decision. Uh, all of the existing leases are valid existing rights. Um, what this dis and most of the prospective areas uh, in the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort where there's industry interest in potential development uh, are still on the table for future leasing. Uh, we really focused on those areas that are uh, either important to subsistence, well established as such, or uh, the area known as Hannah Shoal, uh, which is defined by shallow bathymetry uh, and is sort of a, a driver of uh, the ecosystem in the Chukchi Sea uh, and is sort of an aggregation point for a lot of species, including uh, walrus. Uh, again, an area important to the ecosystem, uh, in my mind, shouldn't be uh, particularly controversial. Uh, there's some nine or 10 existing leases uh, within the Hannah Shoal area. Those leases are still valid. Um, it just won't be considered for future leasing. But the most prospective areas in the Chukchi Sea, including where the majority, vast majority of the current leases aren't affected by the, um, by the decision at all. Um, and so, but again, because of the controversy around the CCP, uh, some of that emotion and concern has um, carried over into uh, the decision related to uh, potential future oil and gas leasing. A uh, couple other points um, with respect to the Chukchi Sea. Um, last week, BOEM, my former agency, completed its supplemental uh, environmental impact statement related to Sale 193, uh, which was conducted back in 2008. All of the current Offshore oil and gas leases in the Chukchi Sea were issued pursuant to Sale 193. It has been plagued by litigation essentially ever since then. Um, the Ninth Circuit last January uh, found specific defects in the original EIS uh, that was conducted back in or completed back in 2007, remanded uh, to BOEM for curative NEPA work. Um, Shell essentially lost a drilling season as a result of that. We had to suspend the leases, uh, conduct the curative NEPA. We completed that. Uh, it was a very aggressive timetable for completion of the work. Uh, Bohm put in a lot of resources, a lot of manpower into that effort. I think did a fantastic job uh, with the SEIS and now the posture is the secretary will make a decision uh, in the coming weeks about whether to affirm that sale. Um, Shell is moving forward with its plans for uh, exploration uh, this drilling season. Uh, we've been working with Shell uh, while also completing the environmental impact statement on their plans and providing feedback uh, with respect to those, including um, lessons learned uh, from Shell's 2012 uh, exploration program. Uh, and we continue doing that work. With respect to the onshore, uh, the Bureau of Land Management in the Interior Department recently issued its record of decision with respect to the Greater Moose's Tooth onshore uh, development project in the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska. It will be uh, the first uh, production from federal lands onshore uh, going into TAPS uh, once it is um, developed. Uh, the decision uh, allows for uh, a road uh, to connect the development uh, and support uh, the development. It also provides for a robust mitigation package because of potential impacts to uh, subsistence, particularly uh, subsistence activity from the uh, adjacent village of New Wixit. Uh, what is, uh, I think, forward-looking about 
um, how that mitigation package will work. You know, mitigation is well-established concept uh, for federal permitting uh, in the lower 48 uh, on renewable conventional energy projects. But what's unique here is there will be a mitigation fund, um, but decision-making about where to put those dollars uh, will be driven by local communities. And so the first step in uh, consistent with uh, what Dr. Holdren was describing as, you know, our commitment to engaging local communities on uh, resource development that uh, could impact or benefit them is the development of a regional mitigation strategy uh, that will be coordinated among the federal family, uh, Alaska Natives in the uh, MPRA, including folks from New Wixit, uh, and the state of Alaska to decide, okay, we have a fund, where do we uh, make best use of, um, of those dollars? Finally, uh, last Friday, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement put out a draft uh, joint proposed rule related to Arctic-specific standards for offshore oil and gas exploration uh, in the U.S. Arctic. Uh, those are largely, uh, they largely codify uh, and further develop uh, Arctic-specific standards that uh, we applied with respect to Shell's 2012 program. They also incorporate lessons learned uh, from that program uh, and are really the first uh, regionally tailored offshore uh, regulations that uh, have been proposed. It won't surprise any of you that many of our standards uh, were designed decades ago uh, for the shallow water uh, Gulf of Mexico uh, and uh, don't fit uh, especially well with the unique operating conditions and challenges uh, of working offshore uh, in the Arctic. And so this is an effort to codify those standards. Uh, apply them to any operator who would propose activity in the Arctic, and also consistent with our um, uh, leadership uh, on the Arctic Council, really put down a marker for the international community on the appropriate way uh, and the appropriate standards under which offshore oil and gas exploration activity um, should go forward. And so we're very supportive of offshore oil and gas. The potential, especially in the Chukchi, is enormous, um, but there's very little margin for error there. And um, there are people uh, who, in a very real way, rely on the Arctic Ocean to put food on the table. Alaska natives will tell you the ocean is our garden, uh, and it's true. They literally go there for sustenance. And so um, that is something that, that is a value that is uh, reflected in these standards, uh, and I'm happy to say one I think Shell embraces completely. Uh, as their activity goes forward in the future, um, they will literally be working uh, in folks' gardens, uh, and um, we hope that uh, Shell, uh, and we hope that the standards that we put out um, uh, carry that with them every day during the, uh, the operation. So that's an overview, and again, I'd be happy to answer questions. Tommy, thank you so much. For those of us who aren't an expert in this area, we've seen a lot of these decisions. They've been coming out. It's been hard to understand them, so we really appreciate you putting them in a very clear and concise context. Thank you so much. So if there is a drilling season, we know that there will be an, uh, an enhanced Coast Guard presence for that drilling Absolutely. season. So over to you, Gary. Absolutely. Thank you. And we, uh, uh, what I'd like, I'm, I'm Gary Rascott, as Heather uh, indicated. I I'm work most of the waterways policy for all the waterways in America, but um, I'm also a retired Coast Guard officer, ship captain who sailed in the Bering Sea in the Gulf of Alaska, so have a, have a good sense for what's up there. But uh, all those things aren't, aren't why I'm here. I'm, I'm also, as one of my other duties, the coordinator for the implementation of the Coast Guard's Arctic policy. And it, it might seem a little strange that, you know, we've got all these people working on the Arctic policy. Why would we need a sort of a senior level coordinator? But I think that drives right to the value of the executive order and the structure that that set up. Um, we determined early on as we, we published the Coast Guard's uh, Arctic uh, strategy uh, right after the national strategy was published, and, and I'll, I'll touch and review a couple of our driving lines of effort in a minute, but I wanted to sort of touch on sort of the agency and the department perspective on the executive order and the structure that it brings to the federal process and why I think that's, uh, it, it, 
it, is, it will be very helpful in, in sort of furthering the efforts laid out in the implementation plan. Um, I think it's very telling. Your, your one slide that I think was so germane to the whole discussion here was that one with the spaghetti diagram with all those. There are a lot, I mean, make no mistake, both federally, state, local, every, there are a lot of people working hard to do the right thing for the Arctic. And unfortunately, some of the coordination probably wasn't as good as it could be. And, I th and this is not a new problem. I was um, actually on the national security staff in, in 2004, and we looked at maritime security at the time, and we saw since 2001 that we had a lot of departments and agencies working very hard on maritime security, but they weren't working together, and there were probably a lot of redundancies and gaps, and I think we see or we feel the same way about the Arctic right now, that there's a lot of folks out there trying to do the right thing, but we don't have that. We have the strategy, we have the implementation plan, but your read of the implementation plan may be a little different than mine, and there's a lot of Arctic working groups out there and what I think the value from a department and agency perspective of what the executive order brings to this is an executive steering committee to tell us what's the number one of all the number ones that are out there and how do we prioritize our efforts um, in what I think everyone will admit is probably a constrained federal budget but what is the most important of the important and one of the key elements of the um, executive order is that the first thing that we have to do, and um, I had the pleasure of working on a group that was able to put that together, and there's several others in the room that had that same experience, um, is to do a gaps and redundancies analysis of all the efforts ongoing right now. And I think what that will show us is to where there might be a little bit of slack in the system where we can maybe apply it to other issues. Uh, I think you'll know, and, and many of you participate in these things, there's, there's certainly a, a lot of Arctic working groups out there right now. And, and, uh, and, and maybe we, we can centralize some of the focus there because I, I, and it's the same people. I, I'm, I've seen several of you here at CSIS events, and it's it's all the same people working on it, and they just go to different meetings and so and say say sort of the same thing. So, what we're trying to do is figure out how to streamline that effort under the um, executive officer that, that that will be appointed by the White House to sort of manage that implementation. And why we we think that's important is because there are limited resources. I mean, one of the things that was center point in our discussions, and, and Tommy and Dr. Holden both alluded to it, is I don't get the sense, and I, I'm certain that most people in this room don't get the sense, that the American public realizes that the United States is an Arctic nation. We are not a nation with an Arctic state. And we are up there, and, and we need to understand that, but there just isn't that galvanizing event there. And so as we try to bring attention to the many issues that are going on with increasing ship transits and other things, it's just hard to sort of muster all the resources that are required to address such a complex and demanding environment to operate. Um, we see from the Coast Guard perspective, there's, there's more water than ice ever was. And, and, and you know, we, 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 well, we don't take a formal position on why that is, but there's more water there. So that means there'll be more human activity. We see that human activity divided into really, you know, from a maritime perspective, four areas. There'll be more transits, be it the Northern Sea Route or the Northwest Passage. There will be more energy exploration. There will be more ecotourism. And there will be more fishing. And, and you know, we, we, the, I think the jury's still out a little bit as to how far north the fish docks will go, but they, there's clearly further north activity than we see. And all four of those levels of activity, or, or sort of buckets of activity, demand Coast Guard action. You know, we, we, we are hearing of, and they're selling tickets for a thousand person cruise ship to make a cruise up there. Think about what a mass at sea rescue looks like up there. And then think about, now that's one thing to think about in the Caribbean when you have sort of all the infrastructure there. Now think about it up in the high north where there's no deep water port. There's, it's three, four days sail to get anything up there. Um, and, and we're thinking about it, trust me, we are thinking about it every day. But um, there's just all really complex issues here. And so in recognizing that, the Coast Guard put together its Arctic strategy, and, and we're, we're sort of right on the heels with the national strategy. And in that strategy, we, we really focus on three lines of effort. One is improving, improving awareness. Um, we need to know what's going on up there on the water and, and, and in, our, in our ports. Modernizing governance, sort of bringing together a, a 21st century look at how we do things up there and, and 
Because of the demanding environment, the limited resources, um, the last one, the, the last two are very closely linked. The last line of effort is broadening partnerships, but no one can do it alone. I mean, I, I said, Heather alluded to my last job, which was much more security related, and I used to say, you know, in today's world, there's very single, very few single agency problems and even fewer single agency solutions. Well, I think the Arctic is, has that in spades because there are very few things that we can do alone as a Coast Guard or alone as BOEM or, or Bessie or any of us. We all have to work together and uh, we need to have that coordination well, sort of well greased and well connected. And we really believe that is what the um, executive order brings to this. It brings a, a sort of a focus. It brings a senior level look at where we're at and it demands federal attention to where we're going. And uh, the other piece of it, and, and Tommy alluded to this a little bit, it also calls out very clearly a responsibility for engagement um, at the local level. And, and we're working hard to develop that, that program and see what the best practices are. And, and I know my, my colleagues are looking from the local level all the way to the DC level as to what's worked out there, what hasn't worked, and how do we give a consistent federal message to regardless of who's visiting you, whether it's um, uh, someone from the Coast Guard or someone from the Department of Interior, because on the other side of the story, the folks that we're, we're working with and for out there, they have limited resources as well. And they need to know what our priorities are because I think they're willing to match them because we all want to move this whole thing forward. But if they're getting different stories from different agencies as to what, what is the most important thing we need to work on in the near term, it's very, one, confusing, and it just slows everything down. So I, I think the, the piece of the executive order that demands the, the sort of unified plan for tribal engagement is, is a critical element that, that we will all reap benefits from. Um, we've got a couple of highlights. I would like to just highlight a couple of, we've got, so we've given you the, the three main lines of effort in the Coast Guard strategy. We've got about 12 areas of emphasis that we're working on, and I just wanted, I won't go through all 12, but I do want to touch on a couple of them. One is to enhance our operations up there, and I, I think some of you are familiar with our Operation Arctic, uh, Arctic Shield up there where we, we work offshore. Um, yeah, and we are, we are, we are, anxiously awaiting the finalization of Shell's plans to, uh, to, to figure out exactly how much Coast Guard we need up there because we are committed to making sure that this is done safely and effectively. So we are, we are looking very much forward to that. And we continue to use those operations to learn how to operate up there to establish, right now we're mobile and seasonal, which means we're there when the people are there. We haven't built any big infrastructure up there, but we're, we're trying to figure out what the best way to go is on that. Uh, I think we saw the high water mark, no pun intended, in, in vessel traffic in 2012 when Shell was up there last. We've seen a little dip in that, but that it's still well above the average norms, uh, and, and, and we are reacting to that. The other piece that we're putting together, and this really goes to this broadening partnerships piece, is um, Dr. Holdren alluded to the Arctic Council. Underneath the Arctic Council, as a sort of independent but complementary body, we're putting together, along with um, all of the Arctic Council, the eight Arctic Council nations, what we're calling the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. We have a model for this. We have an Atlantic Coast Guard Forum and a Pacific Coast Guard Forum, and it's really a body to come together with the eight Arctic nations such that we can learn from each other on best practices as how best to co conduct these complex maritime operations in a demanding environment. And how do we, as Coast Guards, work maritime issues in the most effective way? And we look forward to learning to folks. And this is real. We've got eight nations coming. Um, uh, March 25th and 26th to DC to finalize the terms of reference. It's what we call the experts meeting. So it's at a, it's a little lower level and we're planning for the, our, uh, the uh, uh, an initial Arctic Coast Guard Forum meeting with the heads of the Coast Guards in the fall, uh, September, October timeframe. And we've got all eight nations committed to that. And we just see it as a first stepping point to really sort of, um, I, I get, I get, sort of in trouble from my folks when I say we're operationalizing what, what's going on. In, in, but it really is. These are the people that are on the water. And this is how we sort of operationalize some of those things that the Arctic Council has put together and other folks. And this is how we move forward on this. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, is our Center for Arctic Studies and Policy at the Coast Guard Academy. We, uh, we're, we're just hanging out the shingle on that, but we see it as a way to centralize. We are not going to do climate study. We think we have enough people doing that, but what we need to understand is how does that climate 
changes affect the way you do Coast Guard operations. So we see this as the academic arm of the, of, of the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, and um, we're, we're looking forward to, we've got a, a couple folks up there right now. We just got it going this fall. Admiral Neffinger went up and cut the ribbon on it in uh, October, and we look forward to sort of making that a center of thought for um, Coast Guard and Maritime. Coast Guard with a little CG, all Coast Guards uh, work in their operations and learning from each other. And with that, uh, I think I've said enough. Gary, thank you. That was terrific. Really fantastic presentations. There's a lot to dive into. We've got, we've got a, a nice amount of time for some q and A. I, if with your permission, I'd like to throw out a, a few questions uh, and then uh, turn our audience uh, over and uh, have them ask you tough questions. Just a reminder, this is an on-the-record discussion, of course. And uh, when we get ready to turn to our audience, please, if you could identify yourself as well as your affiliation, uh, and then if you direct your question to a particular speaker, that would be great. I have to say, as a, as a watcher of U.S. Arctic policy, I think this executive order is really important. Uh, we had written a report uh, a few years ago, and I, I thought it was going to be a, an easy task. Just go ahead and describe all the U.S. at the federal level agencies that have a hand in Arctic policy. Eighty pages later, my brain looked like that diagram. It was amazing. And, and in some ways, the policy has been very continuous for many, many decades. Um, it's the coordination that has just been the Achilles heel of this effort. So I think what's so vital is this is now at a very senior level. Uh, it has galvanized uh, agencies at the sub-cabinet level, which is great. And so uh, I, I think this is an important step. But I do have some questions. So if I may uh, fire away. Um, I think that the ingredient, the missing ingredient, and in all of the really wonderful richness of the Arctic strategies that have come forward uh, at the National, at the White House, and the different agencies, they've been great. They've described the problem ac accurately. They have been absolutely silent on budget. Absolutely silent. And I think Washington hands that follow policy, that's great. That strategy is great. Show me where it is in the budget. Show me who's got that. And I, that to me is the frustration here. And as I poured over the EO, I love the prioritization. Love it, love it, love it. But I didn't see money. I didn't see, and, and I'm very concerned, particularly with the U.S. Uh, chairmanship of the Arctic Council, which is a wonderful way for us to get our leadership and our engagement strategy going, there's no new money in that either. So uh, maybe more to, to Dr. Holdren, but to, 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 to Gary and Tommy as well, where are we focusing our resources, our budget? Because we're talking a lot. We're not putting that budget forward. And I'll put that over. They have a few more, but I'll start with that one. Okay, well, I'm, I'm happy to start with that one. Um, and something that Gary said a few minutes ago is certainly germane, which is that uh, in terms of the understanding of the American public of the existence and importance of these issues, uh, that is lacking, and we need to boost it as part of the solution to the question of the budget. Because until you have uh, widespread public support, uh, getting uh, budget increases in this very constrained environment will, will continue to be a challenge. With that said, there are uh, budgets across the participating departments and agencies that are already addressing the many, many questions and interests that were identified here. It's not that there is no money for this. There's money for it in Interior. There's money for it uh, in DHS and the, and the Coast Guard. There's money for it in the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which has 13 agencies and an overall budget in excess of $2.5 billion a year. So while we are not flush, all of these entities have a lot of other competing demands on the money. It is not as if we are unfunded. Uh, the second thing I would, I would say, and, and this relates to the question that some people have, is, is why is OSTP yes, leading this? Uh, I, I will uh, uh, <laughs> maybe answer that in, 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 in some uh, detail, but relevant to the budget part of the question, OSTP collaborates very closely with the Office of Management and Budget in addressing the budgets of every single department and agency which is a participant in the Arctic domain. So we have a, a voice at the innermost table. In fact, at the end of the budget process, the head of, the, of OMB and I meet with the President and the Chief of Staff uh, to assist the President in making the final decisions on what's going into his budget. And so uh, OSTP is in a very good position uh, together with OMB uh, to help with the budget uh, to help with the budget issue. 
Uh, just to, to answer the other implicit question, if you think about where in the executive branch is it possible effectively to coordinate among cabinet departments and agencies, has to be in the White House, has to be in the executive office of the president. You then ask where in the executive office of the president, the options are the National Security Council. If they chair it, it looks like security is the principal issue. National Economic Council, if they chair it, it looks like economic development is the principal issue. Domestic Policy Council has a big chunk of energy and climate change. If they chair it, it looks like it's all about energy and climate change. The, um, the if CEQ chairs it, Council on Environmental Equality, looks like it's all about conservation and environment. OSTP has a piece of every one of those issues. We have the science and technology dimensions of the national security issue, the environmental conservation issue, the energy and climate issue. And so it is, in fact, quite logical for OSTP to chair it, because if any of the other entities did it, it would send a message about the primacy of their particular thing. And our view is that this is a wide array of national interests which need to be protected and nurtured and advanced, and that we don't want to send a message that one particular one is above all the others. That is always my first question I'm asked. I'm so glad you answered that question on why OSTP. Tommy, Gary, I just want to turn to you on any budget issues, and maybe, Gary, I'll be a little bit of a rascal and say, does the Coast Guard feel well-resourced to handle the increased uh, presence? And I'm so sorry. I'm being naughty. <laughs> Well, I, I will suggest that the Coast Guard is uh, uh, appropriately resourced for the current human activity in there. Um, we are always looking towards the future, and I think we, we talked about that, and I, we see that increasing. Um, and I, I failed to mention when I talked about our strategy, our strategy is a 10-year strategy. So we, we, see the, we see the Arctic as a real opportunity to maybe get it right for once from a federal perspective because we have a little bit of time to sort of contemplate what's going on. Now, of course, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to be uh, looking to, to see what the level of activity is and what the right level of assets are for, uh, for the drilling this summer if, if, if that goes as planned. Um, but but th there's some internal adjustments to be made there. But I think we're on a longer plane than some other. And that's, and Dr. Alden, that's exactly where we're, where I think we, 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 we are having a hard time getting people's attention because, and, and a really bad point here, but people say it all, you know, we're on a glacial pace in the Arctic as, as we grow here. It really is not, you know, you're not going, when you say there's a 50% increase in shipping, it, it's 20 to 40. It's not a thousand to you know five thousand transits, and so so it's it's hard to get that attention. Um, but I, I think the the other piece here is is that the executive order and its and its demand to look at these gaps in redundancy is also provides an, an an avenue perhaps for a relook at the prioritization of existing funding. And if we find out that we have two or three agencies sort of doing the same thing, maybe we don't call it the same thing, but we are doing the same thing, there may be a way to reassign. A, through the federal process and through through the executive or office of the president, just to look at some efficiencies there and maybe put be able to put money towards some higher priority issues. So um, I know I didn't exactly answer your question, Heather, but um, I got as close as I could. Can I say one quick thing? I just I just have to comment on the glacial pace. The good news, Gary, is that the pace of movement of glaciers is speeding up. Fair, fair enough. Good to, good to hear. That's also bad news, by the way. <laughs> And we do appreciate good ar Arctic humor here at CSIS. Tommy, before I turn to you, I want to add a question. So after you respond to the budget issue, my next question is really, I think one of the critical elements of the executive order was about the state federal um, coordination. And welcome thoughts on, I think it's to be determined or still being worked out, the presence of the state of Alaska on this steering committee, but clearly, Whenever the federal government visits, whether that's Secretary Jewell, before that, other State Department colleagues have got, they've really gotten blasted. They feel like this, you know, the state isn't being well coordinated. They feel that their interests aren't being heard. This could be unfair of me characterizing it. Feel free to uh, push back on that. But this is really, we're, we, I feel like the state is in one place on the economic development. I feel like Washington's much more on the conservation 
stewardship element of it. There's a balance to be found. How does getting a stronger Alaskan voice here in this process, what's the vision? So let me just amplify one point about the budget, and Gary sort of alluded to it, and give you one concrete example of what the opportunity is under the executive order. Um, the steering committee uh, established by uh, the executive order met just last Friday, uh, and Dr. Holdren uh, chaired that meeting. Uh, and a big part of the conversation was uh, going back to each agency and saying, okay, you know, what are you working on? Uh, what are the synergies? Who should be at the table? And what resources can you bring to bear? Um, folks may have seen um, the front page Washington Post article yesterday on Kivalina. Um, Kivalina is, um, for those of you who didn't see the article, Kivalina is a village of about 400 people uh, north of Kotzebue uh, on the Chukchi Sea and they are on the point of the spear with respect to climate change and under very real threat of being uh, literally inundated uh, and wiped out um, by the increasing intensity of storms due in part to a lot of factors but also um, related to retreating sea ice as the sea ice moves out. There's just a lot more space uh, for the ocean to uh, develop energy that impacts uh, the coastal communities. A big part of the conversation we had was, um, all right, everybody who has, across the federal family, who has equities in this area, what can you do about it? Uh, and how are we gonna marshal resources across the agencies for it? And I'll tell you, uh, and that's just one example, across all of these topics, there was a lot of enthusiasm for that type of exercise. And so, I don't disagree with you. I don't think we've done a good job explaining to the American people how much federal resource goes into uh, the Arctic. Uh, and that's part of what I think the exercise is gonna be is um, making clear uh, and looking for those opportunities where we can bring resources in. And I think the executive order uh, finally gives us an opportunity uh, and an avenue through which to do that, to sort of um, take a real look at what's going on and where there may need to be additional resources brought to bear uh, avenues for thinking about that. Um, with respect to state uh, and federal coordination, again, just to sort of bring a little Alaskan perspective on it, um, this, is, um, this is not a unique issue uh, to Alaskan. This is a common issue uh, across the United States and especially uh, in the West uh, where the Interior Department does a lot of business. There's always concern, um, some of it le quite legitimate, that decisions are being made in Washington, D.C. Uh, without a real understanding of uh, the effects that they could have uh, in uh, out West or in Alaska. Um, I can tell you um, that is very intentionally part of what uh, the executive order is designed to help with, uh, to bring Alaska into that conversation. I'll tell you, with Governor Walker, um, I think we'll have a fantastic partner in this conversation. Um, he is very interested in working constructively uh, with the state. He's, you know, one of the many voices there uh, who hasn't been pleased to say the least with some of these decisions, um, but he's willing to be at the table and he's willing to uh, work with us uh, on um, decision making going forward. And so that's a commitment that this administration's made. It's an opportunity presented by the executive order and it's an important thing that has to happen, um, uh, especially in Alaska, but you know, across the U.S. too. So. Can, I add, Please. can I add one quick, quick point on that? Uh, just to emphasize something that Tommy just said, uh, we just had uh, a few days ago the uh, annual meeting of the National Governors Association. Governor Walker was there. There was an interaction between the governor and the president about exactly this issue. It is absolutely right that this issue arises with many states, not just with Alaska. President Obama is very focused on uh, addressing that with better communication with the governors uh, and did a lot of that uh, over the several days of the National Governors Association. But additionally about Alaska, I would say uh, we are actually in quite a good position to, to address this problem. Number one, 
the Arctic Executive Steering Committee has the explicit responsibility of fomenting a better and more com uh, coordinated communication strategy with the state. Secondly, we've got a number of Alaskans in crucial positions. We've got Tommy in the Department of Interior. We have Fran Ulmer as head of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, former lieutenant governor of Alaska, former chancellor of the University of Alaska uh, in Anchorage, uh, and now in addition to her role as chairman of the Arctic Research Commission, uh, a special advisor to the Secretary of State on, on Arctic issues. And I would also add that while I'm not an Alaskan, my daughter was an Alaskan for 15 years. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're everywhere. Yeah, exactly. No, thank you. Thank you so much. My, my last question before I, I turn the questions over to, to the audience, actually it's a nice segue into the, to the uh, Arctic Council and the upcoming U.S. chairmanship. So help me understand how the Arctic Executive Steering Group will work in cooperation with, with Admiral Papp, the new U.S. Special Representative to the Arctic region, um, and, and sort of help me know, because while the U.S. Uh, agenda that has been laid out, uh, climate change, uh, a lot of uh, renewable energy issues for uh, indigenous peoples, how does this effort coordinate with that, just more of a, a general nature? and then. Uh, just to touch on the geopolitics of the Arctic, uh, Russia. There have been some some press reports and some concerns because our bilateral relationship has so been has been so deeply impacted by the events in Ukraine that there could be some you know preventing very senior we've stopped military to military cooperation. This could in, maybe hamper Gary the Arctic Coast Guard forums uh, eventual evolution. It may prevent our scientists from collaborating together. We are neighbors, uh, and the Bering Strait is going to be a busy place in the coming years and needing that bilateral co coordination. So if I can push us out a little bit from the domestic to the international, getting the panelists' thoughts on uh, the impact of, of Russian uh, relations into U.S. Arctic policy. Well, let me start with the, um, with the issue of the Arctic Council and how the uh, Arctic Executive Steering Committee will interact with it, and then I'll pass the difficult Russia question to my <laughs> colleague, uh, <laughs> colleague to my right. Um, First of all, uh, Admiral Papp uh, and, and Fran Ulmer, uh, both of whom are going to be deeply engaged uh, through the State Department in the U.S. role in the Arctic Council, both sit on the, uh, on the Arctic Executive Steering Committee. And uh, Admiral Papp was at the first meeting last Friday. Uh, Fran Ulmer was only able to join by telephone, but she did join and participate. Uh, I, I think of these activities as joined at the hip. And, and then one of the major functions, as I indicated in my talk, one of the major functions of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee is to support the U.S. Uh, chairmanship uh, in the Arctic Council. So I, I, I don't see any, any problem there. I see a facilitation through the interagency engagement uh, with the Arctic Council effort through the State Department as being a big plus. Um, I might have some things to say about yeah. Russia, but I'm going to I'm going to turn to. Uh, and I have a, I have a bonus question to Dr. Holdren at the end. So. I'll <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that um, it, it's been my observation as we've put together the Arctic Coast Guard Forum that you you need all eight Arctic nations, and and you know there is Russia is a, a major player there, and in fact other nations have told us that uh, unless the Russians are an active participant, um, uh, without you know, what, what's the point? We need we need to get everybody or, 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 or we won't be able to move forward in the way we want to. And I think it's been my observation that we are, we as a country, while, while we have differences with the Russian government, we continue to seek opportunities to engage them in things that we agree with. And I think that it's a, and it, it's an, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to quote it, but I think there's an, you know, an Arctic Council resolution that we, 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 we all agree that we need to protect people in the Arctic, we need to protect the Arctic itself, and, and, and we need to look for the right type of um, uh, exploitation, if that's probably the wrong word, but uh, of resources and how to do that correctly. And I think that manifests itself in the recent SAR agreement, search and rescue agreement, as well as the oil spill response agreements that, that came out of the Arctic Council over the last few years. And, and clearly, the, the, the Russians and, and were, were full partners in, in working through those agreements. And we have invited um, a, a Russian, um, the, their version of the Coast Guard to attend, and they have accepted uh, at the experts meeting. Um, of course, it's day by day. And, and you know, right now, we, we're, we're, we're receiving full support of the U.S. government 
to, to do that, and, and we, we look forward to engaging in the discussions for our common interests in the Arctic, which are really people in the environment. So I think if you focus on those sort of things on a regional basis, I think the cooperation will continue. I'm with the Interior Department. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but you can, you have international activities, absolutely. Well, great. Well, I'm sorry. I, I, I have many more questions, but I have to stop myself. Let me open it up for the audience if they have any questions or comments, or I'll keep going on my list. I'm going to keep going on my list. Okay, well, keep, you keep thinking of those. Uh, you got one in the back. Oh, I do have one in the back. Yeah, my apologies. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good spot. I don't want to block the camera. I'm uh, Paul Cadario from the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Uh, thank you. This has been a very interesting panel. Um, I wonder, though, if there's a broader architecture that you should be looking at, like even when you got down to all the interests and then all the actors on that, and then the three bold points, does it not all relate back to climate change? Something on which um, the United States has had some difficulty coming to a sort of national consensus about and which clearly may be globally, or wor uh, from a, a, a worldwide basis, the only thing on which one might be able to agree about the Arctic, including maybe freezing the petroleum exploration there, because these are going to say this is going to be locked. These are locked up assets. By the time we spend to invest, by the time we comply with all the requirements about safety, and by the time we get it to market, yeah, there are going to be laws, carbon taxes. So I'm just wondering whether there's a broader architecture that perhaps involves the State Department and other agencies of the U.S. government that might be more compelling and might, in fact, provide a better organizational framework for what clearly, like many other aspects of U.S. government organization and policy, is sort of a, a nest of interests within the executive branch and then, of course, on the Hill just because traditionally that's the way things get done in the U.S. government. Not to say that isn't wrong or isn't right, but at the same time, I'm just thinking that a broader focus might provide a better organizing principle for the important work that uh, we've heard about today. Yeah, I will take a crack at that. Uh, obviously, as I indicated in my remarks, uh, climate change and particularly rapid climate change in the Arctic is an influence on virtually every other one of the national interests we talked about. But it is only an influence. It's not the whole story. And there would be uh, some liability in, in trying to argue that climate change needs to be the principal prism through which uh, we view uh, Arctic issues. One of those liabilities, as part of your comment suggested, would be uh, in the U.S. political system, uh, there are many things we might get agreement on that we would lose agreement on if we insisted that uh, everything be seen through the prism of climate change. Uh, I, I think most folks uh, understand and accept that the climate is changing, and it's changing rapidly, uh, uh, particularly in the Arctic. When the Senate voted on this matter, it voted 98 to 1 in favor of the proposition that climate change is real and not a hoax. The argument comes uh, with some of the members uh, of the Congress on the question of what's causing it. But if you simply accept that the climate is changing and observe that it's changing and look at the effects it's having on your other interests, that certainly provides uh, uh, insight into uh, what kinds of resources are going to be needed, what kinds of adjustments in policies are going to be needed. But again, it's, it's never going to be uh, the only factor. Uh, and so I would not embrace the notion that we should uh, somehow make an overarching climate framework uh, the, uh, the essential part of our, of our Arctic policy. It's an indispensable part, uh, but it, uh, and it influences everything else, but I wouldn't use it as the principal prism. If I can sort of pull that question a little further, one of the terms of art that came out with the national strategy was integrated Arctic management, meaning how the science and really that whole of government approach can implement uh, and as, as policy decisions are made, whether that's sectioning off portions of the Chuck Key and the boat for uh, help, uh, Dr. Holdred and, and, and our panelists, I have to say I, I understand the term I don't understand how it works in practice, and how would, will you be bringing integrated Arctic management into the 
work of, of the steering committee? How does science and our, our resources, which I always explain them, you know, I, the United States is an Arctic science power. That is where our, our resources, our, our depth really is. Um, but I don't know if whether the, all that wonderful science is having a greater impact on our long-term policy decisions when it comes to development or infrastructure requirements of the future. Well, I will try to be briefer than I've been in answering previous questions. I think science is playing a major role in informing U.S. policy uh, in the Arctic. Uh, I think you see that all across the board, across the national interests that we've talked about, uh, ranging from the interests of indigenous peoples whose lifestyles and communities are at risk uh, from climate change, to how we think about conservation in the Arctic, to how we think about economic and energy development uh, in the Arctic, to how we think about our maritime uh, opportunities and, and responsibilities. Again, I think uh, that one of the functions of this new Arctic Executive Steering Committee is to make sure that continues to happen. You saw in the diagram, that spaghetti diagram that makes your head explode, that, that there is a tremendous amount of coordination within the bodies that are doing uh, Arctic science, and those bodies uh, are virtually all connected to other aspects of our Arctic policy. So I, 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 I see this as something we really do uh, have our arms around and will continue to uh, with the help of this new uh, executive steering committee. Hello, I'm Larry Minert, head of the Mineral Resources Program at the United States Geological Survey. My question in a nutshell is about the role of China and the context for this question is that even though China isn't an Arctic nation technically, um, they are certainly one of the larger drivers for much of what's going on in the world scene. And in particular, the area that I'm involved in, uh, mineral resources, we're working with the geological surveys of all the other Arctic countries to produce a map of the mineral resources of the circum-Arctic area. And one of the drivers for that is the increased utilization by China of resources in northern Arctic areas, particularly uh, Norway, Sweden, and Finland being transported across the Northern Passage to China, and that may well become one of the more significant um, transportation issues for the Coast Guard and otherwise. So my question again comes back to how do we engage China in this internationally when they're not technically an Arctic nation? Well, China has asked for and been granted observer status in the Arctic Council, so they are present in the meetings of the Arctic Council uh, as observers as opposed to voting, uh, voting members. So that is one, uh, one connection. Uh, there are also uh, connections uh, through the science dimension where we have a bilateral science and technology cooperation agreement with China, which is uh, overseen by a joint commission at the ministerial level, which means I co-chair it on the U.S. side with the Minister of Science and Technology on the Chinese side, and we engage in those meetings, again, pretty much the same array of departments and agencies that you saw uh, on that diagram, and that is another forum in which we uh, can exchange views, notes, and even develop uh, where appropriate cooperative activities uh, in relation uh, to the, the science dimension uh, of the Arctic. But I think the other dimensions might better be commented on uh, by others here. I have nothing to offer on that. One last question, Rob, in the back. I'm Rob Hammett. I'm a student at SICE across the street. And I wanted to ask, it seems that there's, especially in building US government capabilities in the Arctic, there's a kind of chicken and the egg problem because the capabilities are being developed largely to enable the private sector to move into this region. But the private sector is not going to move into this region until those capabilities are fully developed. Um, apart from a couple, you know, uh, vanguard operations like shells. And so how, how do we determine what pace that the government, you know, what, how fast do we need to get Coast Guard ships up into the Arctic if there's not a demand for them yet, but we anticipate it in the future? And I think just to, to broaden that question out a little bit, again, getting back to that finding the balance, there may, there may be some incorrect perception, but there's a perception that while other Arctic nations are very focused on economic development, the United States is hesitant. It's reluctant. It's not sure. It's more of a protective stewardship crouch. Again, that may be an incorrect characterization. 
Will the steering committee have an even balance on economic development as it will on obviously preserving and protecting this, this pristine environment? Well, if, if you look at the membership uh, of, of the steering committee, you see that the answer is yes. Basically, uh, all of the relevant uh, departments and agencies, including those focused on economic development, energy resources, and so on, are represented. Uh, Treasury is represented. The uh, Energy Department is represented. Uh, and they're represented uh, at, a, at a very high level. Uh, again, we're, we're not picking and choosing and saying one thing is more important than all the others. Uh, our task is to reconcile uh, the priorities. I also want to add one point uh, that I should have mentioned before about the China issue. We also have with China something called the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, which meets every year, and it is led by, on the U.S. side by the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, State Department responsible for the strategic part of the dialogue, Treasury responsible for the economic part. Again, all the key departments and agencies uh, from both countries participate in that. And given the State Department's particular role in the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council, uh, that forum is also a very viable one for engaging China on, uh, on their activities in the Arctic and the intersection with our interests. And I can no, say a couple words about sort of the balance issue, um, kind of shorthand uh, economic development relative to uh, conservation. Part of the reason why I wanted to describe some of the recent decisions made by the Interior Department is because I really think um, if you look at them sort of one by one, but then sort of put them together, I think it is a reflection of this administration uh, taking very seriously the need for balance and having an understanding of both um, the unique opportunities that the Arctic presents in terms of conservation, um, but also uh, the unique opportunities that the Arctic, this region, presents for the United States and state of Alaska in terms of economic development. Uh, and so um, this administration um, in 2012 permitted the first offshore exploration activity in uh, the Arctic Ocean uh, in well over uh, two decades. Uh, this administration did this. And so any perception that there's hostility in the administration writ large to economic development in the Arctic, um, I think is a misperception. Uh, there is a strong concern, and I believe this is appropriate, um, that uh, activity economic activity, oil and gas activity, offshore and onshore in the Arctic, as it goes forward, be done the right way. Um, and that is really your point about uh, integrated Arctic management, for example. That's sort of at the heart of it. Um, what is special about uh, the Arctic uh, and part of why, you know, I love um, being in government at this moment in time is uh, it presents a real opportunity, not only for coordination, but for vision, right? There's an opportunity in the Arctic to uh, transcend uh, project by project considerations and look at the landscape uh, in a way that is true in the lower 48, but doesn't present quite the same, um, uh, quite the same opportunity. And it's with that spirit, honestly, that uh, we go into these decisions, and I think there's a reason why um, you've seen sort of a presentation of these decisions um, grouped the way that you have, um, because I think they help tell that story. Um, with the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, you have a special, unique, intact ecosystem that frankly doesn't exist um, anywhere, anywhere else in the world. Um, in the offshore areas and in uh, MPRA, you see some opportunities for economic development, uh, and we want to encourage that, and we want to make sure it goes forward in the right way. Um, and with the standards that the Interior Department recently put out with respect to offshore oil and gas exploration, I think, as I said before, you see um, this administration seizing the opportunity to show leadership on uh, not only supporting that activity, um, but articulating uh, the right way, in our view, uh, to go about it. Uh, and so uh, where others see, you know, sort of ping-ponging or whatever, I actually think there's, um, 
there's real coherence and real strategic thought being given to it. Thank you so much. We have 30 seconds, literally. And uh, in the implementation plan, there was mention of perhaps a, a White House, a summit, a, a bigger conversation about the Arctic. I think all of you have really underscored the need for education, public awareness, conversation about the United States as an Arctic nation. Dr. Holdren, any thinking, because the U.S. chairmanship actually stretches two administrations. We will finish in the spring of 2017. There will be a new administration. What is the thinking to sort of at the conclusion of the Obama administration hosting some sort of a, a broader conversation about the Arctic? Uh, the short answer is yes, we are thinking about that. Uh, the, the, the notion of, of, of communicating very broadly about the Arctic is uh, certainly part of our assignment, uh, and, uh, and we're on it. Well, great first start, if I may say so, because we had such great uh, colleagues here who are extremely busy but gave very generously of their time to really give us a really interesting picture. We will follow this story and we wish all of you the very best of luck and the Arctic Executive Steering Committee. Please join me in thanking our panelists. And under the other scenarios, uh, the scenario where we take really uh, forward-leaning measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions around the world uh, gives you the, the green scenario, and even there one ends up uh, with uh, less sea ice uh, than, uh, than we have now for at least a period, period of time. Give you a quick uh, chronology of uh, milestones in the history of Arctic policy and coordination. Uh, starting with the Arctic Research and Policy Act of 1984, which was amended in 1990. It was that act that created the U.S. Arctic Research Commission uh, and the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Commission. The Arctic Research Commission makes recommendations. The Ar uh, Arctic Research Policy Commission uh, coordinates the responses to those recommendations across uh, federal agencies. The eight-nation Arctic Council uh, international uh, effort to uh, coordinate and cooperate was established in 1996, and we'll come back to the Arctic Council uh, at the end because the United States is assuming the chairmanship of the Arctic Council for two years starting this spring. Uh, Arctic region policy established uh, by the National Security Policy Directive 66 and Homeland Security Policy Directive 25 in January 2009. Uh, the National Ocean Council, which was established in July 2010 as part of the National Ocean Policy announced at that time by President Obama, has as one of its two major geographic focuses the Arctic. The other one is the uh, Caribbean, the Gulf. Um, Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement, that's another international agreement that was fomented under the auspices of the Arctic Council in January 2013, an agreement to collaborate on search and rescue uh, in the Arctic. Uh, the Interagency Report on Arctic Management, this was a committee chaired by then Deputy Secretary of Interior David Hayes, focused primarily uh, on the intersection of energy development and conservation, but uh, involved a strong interagency component uh, and produced uh, a wide-ranging report. The national strategy for the Arctic region was first rolled out uh, under the leadership of the National Security Council in May 2013, an implementation plan for it the following January, and a report on uh, implementation of that um, uh, strategy, national strategy for the Arctic region was just issued last month. And finally, uh, as Heather has already mentioned, uh, just last month uh, the President issued an executive order on enhancing coordination of national efforts in the Arctic, and that included the creation of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, uh, which I now chair. The two well, good morning, you hearty souls. Thank you for joining us on a snowy day, although I must admit it's the perfect setting for a conversation about the Arctic. Good morning, my name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I have the great privilege of looking after Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. Um, this in some ways has been a bit of an Arctic week for us here at CSIS. Yesterday, we had the privilege of hosting the Norwegian 
visiting foreign minister in a conversation about finding that Arctic balance between economic opportunities and, and environmental protection. And of course, we talked about a range of geopolitical issues that are impacting the Arctic. But today is a conversation that we're going to focus in on the United States and the development of our policy as we look forward in two very short months uh, to assuming the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. I can't imagine that we have uh, any three officials that can help us understand uh, some very new developments in U.S. Arctic policy formation and coordination. At the end of January, the White House released an executive order that uh, pro provided a new uh, framework, a, a new uh, structure, a, an Arctic Executive Steering Committee. And uh, we're here to learn more about that very, not even barely a month old executive order, what it will mean, uh, the impact it will have on uh, U.S. Arctic policy. With us this morning, we have and are delighted to welcome Dr. John Holdren, Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. He's served as the Assistant to the President for Science and Technology since 2009 and co-chairs the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And as of end of January, he has a very new title, Chair Arctic Executive Steering Committee. So he is the leader of this new entity. And uh, Dr. Holdren, we're, we're grateful that you're here and we look forward to your uh, presentation to help give us a little bit more uh, understanding of this new uh, new steering committee. And then with us, uh, Tommy Boudreau to my left, Chief of Staff to Secretary Sally Jewell at the Department of Interior prior to becoming uh, Chief of Staff in March of last year. Mr. Boudreau was the Director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management from 2010 to 2014. Uh, he has done a, a lot of work uh, looking at the Department of Interior's engagement uh, with the uh, uh, drilling activities in the Chutki and the Beaufort, and we're delighted. Uh, Secretary Jewell was just in Alaska, just had a very tough hearing uh, on Tuesday with uh, Senator Murkowski, so we're looking forward to hearing. We'll do it again next week. And we'll do it again next week, because <laughs> it was so much fun again, and uh, we look forward to thank you so much. We really look forward to your insights. And then last but not least, we have Carrie, uh, Gary Rassicott, Director of Marine Transportation Systems at the Coast Guard. Admiral Pete Neffinger was to be with us, the Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard. 2009 Arctic policy uh, listed uh, a number of aims, uh, and you see them here, again, underscoring uh, the diversity and complexity of our national interests in the Arctic, the national security uh, issues, the environmental and conservation issues, uh, resource management and economic development, international cooperation among the eight Arctic nations, uh, involving the Arctic's indigenous communities in decisions that affect them, and enhancing scientific monitoring and research on local, regional, and global environmental issues as they are playing out uh, in, the, in the Arctic. The 2013 strategy uh, consolidated those aims under three large headings, protect U.S. national and homeland security interests, promote responsible stewardship, and foster international cooperation. That's not a change, it's just a binning of the different uh, goals listed under the 2009 uh, strategy. Uh, reports are coming out at a great rate. Here are three of them. The National Strategy for the Arctic Region is on the right. Uh, managing for the Future in a Rapidly Changing Arctic, uh, report to the President. And uh, on the left, Arctic Research Plan 2013 to 2017. These five-year plans come out uh, at intervals uh, from uh, the National Science and Technology Council, which I also chair on behalf of the President. Um, complicated terrain, uh, this uh, Venn diagram is uh, indicative of uh, how many different entities are involved in these uh, major bins of science and stewardship, energy development and transportation, security, uh, and international uh, relations. And of course, uh, they overlap and intersect, which is one of the reasons uh, that we need uh, a systematic uh, and comprehensive approach to coordination. Um, this amazing diagram, which if you stare at it too long may cause your heads to explode, is uh, a visualization of who's talking to whom, just in the domain of research coordination. Uh, and, um, and, and by the way, we will post this uh, PowerPoint 
on the OSTP website. I suspect you folks may post it as well. And so f f any of you who want to stare at these in more detail and at this one in particular risk your head exploding, it will be, uh, it will be available. But again, what th this basically illustrates is there is a tremendous amount of interaction that goes on uh, among the various departments and agencies in the federal government that have equities, responsibilities, and activities in the Arctic. Uh, the executive order came out uh, on January 21st, enhancing coordination of national efforts uh, in the Arctic, and uh, again reiterates the uh, strategic, ecological, cultural, and economic issues uh, that uh, constitute our national interests in the region and, and creates this uh, uh, Arctic Executive Steering Committee. And this part, but uh, had to be pulled away uh, for another uh, assignment. So we are delighted that Mr. Rasakot could be with us. Um, uh, Gary has uh, responsibilities for waterways management, coastal and marine spatial planning, and polar ice operations. Yes, I fear you're going to get a question about an icebreaker. Um, uh, and prior to this, uh, his work as uh, director, he served as the director of Global Maritime Operational Threat Response Coordination Center from 2010 to 2013. So I wasn't kidding. We have uh, great minds here to help us uh, tease out a little bit more on uh, U.S. domestic policy as it evolves towards the Arctic. And with that, we welcome you all, and we turn it over to Dr. Holder for his presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Heather, uh, and thanks to uh, all of you for showing up uh, on a snowy morning. Uh, and thanks to those who are watching uh, the webcast. Uh, I want to start by mentioning that I'm accompanied by Dr. Simon Stevenson, who is OSTP's Assistant Director for Polar Science. He's right down here, and if I get any really hard questions, of course, I'll just refer them to him. So let me uh, start uh, this tour of the terrain, as it were, with a look at the geographic terrain, uh, what we consider officially to be the Arctic uh, within the framework uh, of the Arctic Council and our other Arctic activities, uh, all United States and foreign territory north of the Arctic Circle, and all U.S. territory north and west uh, of the boundary that is shown there extending below uh, the Arctic Circle. Now, maybe this page down works better. Okay. Good. I just have to get the right page down key. So we have, uh, as I think everybody in this room probably already knows, a large variety of national interests in the Arctic. Uh, defense, uh, sovereign rights and responsibilities, maritime safety, uh, the economic issues, including particularly those around uh, energy development, environmental stewardship, scientific research, extremely important, uh, indigenous peoples and their rights and cultures, and of course, uh, preservation of the rights, freedoms, and uses of the sea as reflected in international law. Uh, change is happening rapidly in the Arctic and complicating uh, many of these national interests, but also opening up uh, new opportunities with respect to, to others. Uh, the temperature in the Arctic has been increasing uh, more than twice as fast as the global average uh, temperature increase. That's for well understood uh, scientific reasons. And uh, this simply illustrates uh, that the 2014 temperature anomaly compared to a 1951 to 80 average, uh, and the browner the uh, shading, the faster the uh, rate of temperature rise. As I've already noted, that rapid warming is presenting both challenges and opportunities. Uh, shrinking sea ice extent and thickness mean, of course, expanded maritime navigation possibilities. We'll doubtless hear more about that from Gary. Uh, th that expansion means, of course, economic benefits, including much shorter shipping routes uh, in many circumstances, but also some jurisdictional issues, increasing ship traffic and the need to manage that, and uh, the possibility of pollution and accidents uh, from that uh, additional shipping. Expanded access to seabed resources uh, in the Arctic. Again, economic benefits, but again, also jurisdictional issues. Uh, and uh, increasing industrial activity resulting from those opportunities. And again, uh, a set of uh, pollution and accident possibilities. Uh, those first two uh, sub-bullets imply increasing requirements for the Coast Guard, for the Navy, for other oversight management and regulatory functions in the region. Uh, another challenge is existential threats to creatures that depend 
on the rapidly shrinking sea ice and the indigenous communities that utilize those creatures uh, as uh, important parts of their livelihoods. Uh, increased risk to coastal communities and infrastructure from the combination of sea level rise and the loss of shoreline protection by sea ice, which when it's in place keeps big waves uh, from storms from impacting uh, shoreline settlements uh, and infrastructure. Uh, another issue, thawing permafrost uh, threatens land transport uh, and a variety of kinds of infrastructure, including pipelines. Uh, and warming is altering plant cover, increasing vulnerability to wildfires, and affecting other aspects of ecosystem dynamics. Uh, just to give you uh, a picture of the extent of the shrinkage of the sea ice, uh, you can barely see, I, I think, the magenta line, but the magenta line is the average sea ice extent at its September minimum during the period 79 to 2000. And you look at the 2005 extent, already much smaller than that, 2007, uh, smaller still, and the record uh, low sea ice extent since satellite observations began, giving us really accurate measurements, uh, occurred in September. 2012, and you see the enormous opening uh, compared to that magenta line, the enormous opening of uh, maritime possibilities and seabed access. Uh, this shows uh, both the history of Arctic sea ice extent at its September minimum and the projections under various scenarios of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and one sees that under the, the red projection, which is really continuation of business as usual, the world decides to do uh, essentially nothing uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The summer sea ice actually disappears uh, entirely uh, by the end of the century.